here we go. And it's doing its thing. See, it's very finicky, finicky, this, this thing. It's very finicky. And here we are. I think we're live. If you're on Facebook Live or on, on the Fonz Museum Facebook page, you hopefully are seeing us live. I mean, I, it, says we're, it says we're live on Facebook. And you got to trust it because whatever Facebook says, right, if it's not coming from Russia, has to be true. We know that. We know that. Hey, look. Hi, everyone. I'm Emil Guillermo, the museum director of the Filipino-American National Historical Society Museum. See, it, it's in print, so you can see it. It's real. We do this every Saturday and Sunday. I know. Every Saturday and Sunday, we go live. We do this show. And if you're here at 11.45 or 11.47 Pacific Time, you are one of our entitled, entitled uh, viewers because uh, we like to do this preamble before we hit our guest, we don't really hit her, but we hit the top of this the hour uh, with our guest. And we, but this is where we talk about the museum. We talk about stuff. We talk about what I call this week in Filipino American history, because there's a there's a lot of it that we haven't gotten to, and so we'll get to that. But you know, you're seeing the behind the scenes. Um, you're seeing us act behind the scenes here at the museum. Once again, we are closed, but for the last six weeks or so we have been doing these pop-ups as a way to connect with you so we're closed because of covid or we we have to get the protocol together so that we're masked up and we can get the museum to you live safely and because it takes some time we're closed this week but we're the board all the workers at the museum are getting together this weekend we're gonna we're, we're gonna finalize protocol to enable you to visit the museum safely Okay, so that's happening. But in, in the meantime, we do these virtual pop-ups as a way to say we're here and the museum is, in fact, where you are. Where you are on Facebook, where, wherever you are listening and viewing this, you're the Filipino-American story. You're Filipino-American history. And we're going to talk about that at the top of the hour, like I said. But I, I do this here the, this week in Filipino American history as a way just to talk about how history works in the context of our lives now and how it's important uh, to just understand that and then know that we are living history. You know, that that's a kind of a, uh, a time honored phrase that, that we're living history. But I just like to say history is where you are. The museum is where you are. And our function is to help bring out our Filipino American stories. Okay, so we have a good one today. We talked to Amanda Upson, who is the producer of the film, The Legacy of the Fighting Filipinos. But coming up at the top of the hour at uh, my time noon, we'll be talking to the smiling woman that you see on the screen with me, if you're on gallery view. Maybe if you put it on speaker view, you'll see me, just me, but you'll see Tam Tammy Botkin, who is the director of the documentary. And I want to ask her about the creative and uh, uh, the decisions on what stories to tell, whose story to tell. And if you saw the promotional the image of women firing rifles, fighting Filipinas, we're going to talk about the fighting Filipinas and how they are a part of Filipino American history, a very important part. That's the whole key to the documentary. So that's that's Tammy. You see her on gallery view with me, but put it on speaker view and you see me talking about this week in Filipino American history. And I I mentioned this because this week, October, really the biggest thing happened on October 3rd, right? October 3rd is still part of this week. That that Immigration Act of 1965, you cannot discount that. I know we talk about it briefly with Dan Gonzalez. We talk about it again, you know, throughout last week. And you can go back to the to the recording and hear what Dan had to say about that. But if you don't really honor and understand the significance of that Immigration Act and the, the way it was passed in a bipartisan fashion, boy, you you're, you're missing out on 
the real flow of Filipino history from 1965 forward. Because from 1934 to 1965, there were quotas. No more than 100, 150 Filipinos were allowed each year because they were racist. They were, uh, they were just really illegal sexist and racist quotas placed on the Filipinos, discriminatory quotas. They were lifted in 65, and that sent more than 20,000 or upwards of 20,000 Filipinos to the United States from 1965 forward. That's the creation of the Filipino American community. And when you understand that and you say, well, when did mom integrate immigrate or when did dad immigrate or when was I born as a Filipino American? You, you begin to see some of the things about our history that are, that explain things that, you know, you say, well, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And really we don't, understand why things happen unless we go back to the historical root. So if you're wondering about suddenly why this boom happened in Filipino history or Filipino, the Filipino American community, well, there were racist quotas prior to 1965 and in 65, they let us all in, not all, but 20,000 a year. Significant. If you were born post 65, explains why you were born here in America and not like some friends of yours who you know who may have been born in the Philippines and then immigrated later, or you know, the circ this is the circumstances of how a Filipino American community was built. Now I'm gonna share a screen because I, I wanna I wanna show this picture. And now I've got to set up the picture again. And this is why we do our, our little preamble at the beginning. But I uh you may have seen this picture that because I've shared it on the, the Fonz Facebook page. And and that is the picture of it's it really is the core of Filipino family life, right? Uh and when I say that, I I mean what is more the core of Filipino family life than the Filipino wedding? The Filipino this is where it begins, right? You get here to America and then you have a wedding and then all your Filipino friends come and you stand next to a cake. And then you see the beginning of a real Filipino American community. This is my, my mom and dad are here at the center. My, my dad, Willie, Willie Gillier, my mom, Josie, Josie, and the cake. I do not pop out of the cake. The cake is, it's a wedding cake. But here, this is the Filipino American community. And how my mom and dad met is really a function of the Filipino American community. You know, my father, as many of you know, came in 1928. And I tell this story about how my father, he came in 1928. What did he find? He found the depression. He found, he found anti-intermarriage, anti-miscegenation laws. Found no, very few places to work unless he went into the fields. But my father stayed in San Francisco. This is San Francisco, by the way, where they wanted to stay. He wanted to stay and work in the restaurants. He didn't want to work in the. He came from Luwag, which is like that was like ag enough for him. He wanted to get out of there, and so he came to the. He stayed in the city, 1928, and then 28, 38. 48, 58, no, no wedding, no family prevented. Anti-intermarriage laws prevented him. There were no Filipino women, right? No family. And I've talked previously in this, uh, in this, uh, this venue about how oh, I've talked to Peter Jamero about the bridge generation. He's lucky enough. He's lucky enough to have been had a fa father and mother who in the twenties and thirties were able to have this, have a family, have a wedding, start a family. And Peter Jamero is 90 years young and he can talk about that. And he's a member of that bridge, that so-called bridge generation. That's a wonderful part of Filipino American history. The bridge generation. But what about us little bridgers? 
you had to wait till after the 50s when when filipino americans could or filipinos can have a family and have this and have a cake like my father who waited from the 20s to the 50s to have a cake and have a a, a wife a bride and have a family well this is families of these other guys my cousins and uncles but now that's when the clock starts for him in the 1950s and then and then i was born i pop out of the cake oh man we got to do something about that history we got to like <laughs> but i mean that's i mean for a long time i thought my dad because of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. I just thought he was just uncool. And you know, maybe it was those, those you know, baggy suits. Couldn't get, a, couldn't get a mate. Couldn't find a bride. I thought maybe that was the reason why, you know, he just got stuck. Filipino stuck. But now we know. Because we know the history. He wasn't stuck. He was caught in this web of racism that existed that was there that snarred filipino americans because they came as americans remember they came as nationals and they came no greek card necessary but no rights either so a little picture like that was enough to I mean, I saw, I, I have to, I owe it to my cousin, my cousin, um, Faye, there she is there on the lap of my uncle Mel, my uncle Mel was told by my father, my father told my uncle Mel to come to America. He was willing to stay in the Philippines, but he came to America, met my, my auntie Lo, started a family. There was Faye. Faye found these pictures. This is from the 1950s. Faye found these pictures recently and sent them to me and said, hey, here's your mom and dad. And here you can see your, your mom's handwriting, signing this picture and sending it to my father, she said. There's Faye. So I thank my, my cousins. And this is an example. If you have a picture like this, if you have, the picture tells a story story of our story our, our history and it's a worthy story that that we can share because if you go down just a little deep you'll find that there was history there history that will tell us why or explain what happened to us as a filipino american community so i welcome you if you have a picture like that Send them, send them to, to me, uh, the museum director here at the Philippine American National History Society Museum. Uh, send my, my email, filipinomuseum at gmail.com, filipinomuseum at gmail.com. One of the things about this, this kind of history, is that there are these everyday things that happen. My father met my mother because one of those women in that picture was pregnant and was at a grocery store. My father, who was a cook, was shopping for vegetables. He was on a busman's holiday, as it says, as they say, looking for vegetables. And the woman who was pregnant uh, had a big bag of groceries, and my father wanted to help her carry it back to her, her whatever, her place. That woman, my Auntie Joy, who recently passed away about a year ago, was telling me this story that, you know, my dad was this gentleman who helped carry her groceries and at that point my auntie joy said hey uh we have a bunch of people here from the community who are just hanging out we're having coffee and why, why don't you come meet my comadres and one of the comadres was my my mother and that's that was called filipino tinder in 1950 i guess that's how they met I'm sure your family has a similar story because the Filipino community was close knit and you saw another Filipino and you said, you just knew it happens today. You go to a, you go to a place that you don't know people and they go, Filipino diba? 
Hey, you just know. You just know that that that's that's the beginnings of Filipino American community. Happened in San Francisco, happened in Stockton, happened happened everywhere. Stockton, of course, I pointed out in the, the Fonz Facebook page that I could tell by the, the the carpet that that was the house in San Francisco that we lived in because it was like a palm tree carpet. Um, but the, uh, you know, and so that was the Filipino American community in San Francisco, but we all came to Stockton for the Lechon. The Lechon. We came for the Lechon. So there was always that, you know, Stockton was practically New York City. And to get from San Francisco to Stockton, you had to go over the Altamont, and that was that was a trek. But hey, when you come from Lawag to San Francisco on the Dollar Steamship Line, what's driving over the Altamont, huh? Even the old Altamont. So I encourage you, if you've got a picture, send them to me, Filipino Museum at gmail.com. A woman was on our Facebook chat. Uh, during these pop-ups and she said she was doing a history of <clears throat> excuse me Filipino American <clears throat> excuse me I'm doing my Trump impression now <clears throat> excuse me she was doing a history of Filipino American pop bands in the in Northern California because they were the they serenaded the Filipino American teenagers in the 60s and 70s you know, they played Tower of Power. They played Chicago songs. They played all the high school dances. And they, they were some good musicians. You know that. The bands that you see on all those old pictures from the 20s and 30s, well, what were they like in the 60s? There were these Filipino bands. Bands like the Revelers. Do you remember? Okay, now I date myself. The Revelers from the Vervello family in San Francisco's Richmond District. So here's this one woman who said, I'm going to put together a history of these bands because before, like late, later on, we had people like DJ Qbert, you know, they were the cool guys, the DJs who actually scratched, you know, records. But in the seventies and sixties, it were, it were, it was these Filipino bands. Like the revelers come to mind. I know there were, there were other bands, but the revelers, mainly because I knew them from the Richmond district, of San Francisco. And one of them was married to one of my cousins. I, coincidence, coincidence. But she, this woman is doing a history of the Filipino bands. And so we, we're going to talk about it on one of these pop-ups. I'm sure they had bands in Stockton. I'm sure they had bands all. Ron Bonaventura did uh, a Zoom meeting a couple months ago talking about all those great, Pinoy events, uh, you know, the, the Pinoy events in L.A. And how they were, you know, there was a kind of a gang thing. But but when what the real function of these uh, Pinoy night, Pinoy, Pinoy cultural nights were to bring the, the people together, the Filipino American community together. That's worthy of discussing his history. And that's what we want to do here at the museum talk about history in a new way talk about history in a way that is not stuffy that it's just really us telling our stories right no put noting allowed or you can footnote if you want but i know you just tell the story we want to hear the story here when we do these pop-ups and we do our programs at the Vons museum so Contact me, send me your pictures, tell me your stories, get on the pop-up. And now we end my This Week in Filipino American History, and we go to our formal program, which uh, includes our special guest. She's been patiently standing by, and I appreciate her patience. Tammy Botkin, thank you for being here. Tammy is the director of The Fighting, The Legacy of the Fighting Filipinos, a new documentary that you're still, you're almost done, is it? Mm -hmm. We are, and, we're almost done. So, well, thanks and, for having me. Yeah, and sorry, you know, we do this little thing uh, before, beforehand, but we tell people that right at noon, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, get to 
our special guest. You're our special guest. We talked to Amanda before she was the producer. You're the director. So tell me about your involvement. Clearly, you must have some connection to the Filipino community because it's not it's not obvious, but I'm sure there's a what what got you involved in the story? Well, it's it's kind of wild. Um, I didn't know anything. Uh, I, it, it was shocking to find out how absolutely ignorant I was on the entire subject, um, down to the fact that I didn't even know that the Philippines had ever been a part of the United States. Yeah, That's really, really common though. The average American doesn't know this stuff. Um, how I came to this was um, I had an aunt who passed away in 2015 um, and my uncle um, had been going through the house and uh, he, he, he'd come over once a month for dinner and, and he'd tell me about different things. And he said, well, there's this crate, there's this big crate. It's been in the basement for 40 years. And uh, I knew that there were paintings in them, but I didn't know what they were. So I cracked it open. And um, he said, they're horrific. There are these horrific paintings and I don't know really what they are, but they're from World War II. And um, it took a while for him to actually convince me to pay attention. Um, because I have a very low opinion of war. Um, I don't like it. I don't like what happens. I don't like what happens to people. So um, I actually put him off for about a year and finally he brought me pictures of the paintings and um, we started going through together um, and uh, eventually got connected through a, a friend of a friend of his um, with a veteran who had served in the Philippines during World War II. And his name is Frank Francone, and uh, you'll see a little bit of him in the documentary. But um, he's the one who, who really explained that, oh, these paintings, these paintings are the Bataan Death March and POW camps. Um, so but how I'll, were they in the crate? They were, they, were, they were just in the crate that he had. The crate, not protected. Yeah. Um, just four massive oil paintings um, that, and, that have been in that crate. And who and who did the paintings? Who who was the artist? There were two different artists um, that were part of the U.S. Army: um, Paul Lance and um, oh, sorry, but it was an, another <laughs> another military person, though. Right? Yeah, they were two military personnel, and we we could see that from the signatures. Um, we could see from the dates on the paintings that they were done in 1944. They were completed right after the U.S. government lifted the censorship on the story of Colonel Dias, who had escaped from one of the prison camps. Um, you know, so that was one of our first things that we were trying to figure out, my uncle Vic and I, um, was um, where did the paintings come from? Where are they officially commissioned? Um, what, what was the whole deal with them? How did they even come to my aunt? Turned out that the um, CEO of Hamilton Field, where the two officers were um, assigned in 1944, um, was the one who gave them to my aunt. So um, it just, something so, that my uncle ended up with. <laughs> so it just, I right, so took it. Your, your interest began from here, right? So right. Your, your, your real interest is in all the veterans of World War Two, who were in the Philippines and who were part of that Bataan Death March and the Bataan Death March is many of our um, many people who know from having read about them more Filipinos than than American soldiers. Much more. And, and it was funny because I was still, I was still resistant for a while um, about, you know, it's my uncle would say, well, my lawyer says we should do a documentary or something. And, and I, I kind of, I had a snotty attitude. I'll admit, I was like, literally white man make war. That is what I had to say about the matter. Um, what is new? And it wasn't until Frank Francone then introduced us to General Taguba and the Filipino Veterans Recognition and Education Project that we finally started to really understand what the story in the Philippines was, what the US history is behind 
everything backing up to 1898. Um, and then at that point, I looked at my uncle and I'm like, now you've got me. Um, because if it was just going to be a war story, if it was just going to be about the war art, even I, there's been a million stories told, but I needed something much more compelling, something that most Americans really did not understand or know. Um, and, and, and it grew too, because originally the project um, that I had agreed to work on with my uncle was not a feature length film. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is a, this is a, a massive undertaking. It, it requires research and then you got to put together, you're not, you're not quite finished with the film, but you went to all these Filipino groups. Did they, I, now one of the stories and the reason why we're talking is I, I'm going to share my screen here too now, uh, because there was a, uh, on the, let's see, on the main picture of the, well, I, I don't, I don't have that screen now. I don't know where that is. Um, women left out of the fight okay here it is and i'm going to share this because it it's it's a it's a shocking picture to me because you don't you don't really understand this that when women were fighting and this is from um the women left out oh i mean this, this when we um when we think of women fighting, we think of nurses. And in fact, when the Veterans Equity Act was passed, women did get some equity, but they had to be nurses. But the women who actually fought and were in the, uh, you know, on the front lines, what did they, what happened to them, Tammy? Well, if you look at the um, actual uh, policies that were held by the U.S. government, um, even beyond the rescission acts, which were an atrocity in and of themselves, um, you come across the uh, Philippine Guerrilla Recognition Guide from the U.S. Army. And that is where I think it's on page 221 or so, um, or maybe it's 260, but um, that little graphic down there point F, that women guerrillas be excluded. Um, it was generally understood uh, by the policy recognizing guerrillas that unless a woman could prove that she was a registered nurse and that was the capacity in which she was working, uh, that she was not eligible to be added to the guerrilla roster, therefore not eligible for recognition down the line. And how many of these women were there? Because I know that there are gorillas that we have honored at the museum. Uh, there's one woman right now who um, is on the on one of our walls as because uh, she won a silver star, and and she's one of the the few who've been recognized, but most of them weren't. Whoa. I believe that there were five silver stars given out to women in the Philippines during World War II, if I recall correctly. Um, but um, for the most part, uh, once the war ended, if you were a woman, um, unless again, you were a registered nurse and you pursued your case, you were not going to be recognized. Um, and that was a big surprise to come across. Um, I was actually interviewing people for the film, uh, before I actually knew that this was a problem, I was interviewing Seth Watkins, uh, one of the attorneys that we show in the film. Tell and me, tell me about some women's stories though that you you found. So part of the circumstance where they were actually gun-toting Filipinas, mm -hmm. and they were, you know, were not recognized as guerrillas. Um, you know, earlier this week on our Facebook page, we put up a picture of Benita Perez. We don't know a lot about her, but um, we came across her photo in the National Archives records. And um, luckily, the Signal Corps was very good at documenting who they had taken a photo of and what that person was doing. Um, she was a 16 year old woman gorilla who um, had actually dispatched uh, three enemy troops with just a knife. 
Um, we elected not to get into the detail of her guerrilla activity um, on Facebook because it's still hard to wrap our brains around that women were forced into combat roles. And this was actually true in Europe, but you know, in the US we're fairly insulated. So women, uh, you know, prior to recent years, we're not allowed in combat. Um, it just, it wasn't going to happen. And so we still grapple with the, the images of um, women taking up arms and fighting. Uh, it doesn't fit our Victorian kind of image of women that we still somewhat cleave to in this country. Yeah, and um, so so there were, you, there were five silver stars mm -hmm. and for the most part, the women, um, like the one that we honor at the museum, it, they were intelligence officers. They, you know, they passed on uh, intelligence. I don't think they were, you know, artillery fighters. But what, what does this image that we are showing? What does it say about the gorillas? Yeah. So this one, I just found really interesting. Um, I have not uh, done a ton of research to figure out exactly where this comes from. But when you have the whole photo in view, you can see um, that there are instructions written on the wall um, in English. Um, but you have here a whole bunch of women who are being obviously taught uh, some combat stuff here. Um, and are they gorillas? Um, you know, I have not been able to ascertain on this on in, in this particular case um, where these women were officially attached um, if it was guerrilla unit units or if something of this is actually attached to the Philippine army um, it is a it's like going down the rabbit hole uh, searching out information because there's so much information um, you know, there's books, um, uh, Gay Panlilio, who was uh, a guerrilla fighter and uh, um, with General Markings uh, guerrillas. Um, she wrote a book called The Crucible uh, and, and you get a first time or a first person account from a woman of what it was to be a guerrilla. And she wrote it very much as an apologetic to uh, middle America back in, you know, 1949, 1950, uh, as part of the apologetic to say, hey, will you properly recognize those of us who served and how we served? Um, there's another book, uh, Amazons of the Huck Rebellion, that uh, the first 60 pages is full of stories uh, and the names of women who served uh, in the guerrilla troops, it, far more than just the capacity of a, uh, of a registered nurse. Um, these women were leading troops and they were formidable fighters. And among the, the Hucks, uh, as many as one in 10 of the troops was, an act, was a woman. Um, it wasn't that high in other troops, but you know, there's a significant number of women who served who by regulation, and the regulation is law, um, they're not recognized. And I have a problem with that. So where do you see this film that you're working on? How does that rectify the, the issue? Because we know, and I've talked about this with the producer, Amanda, that, you know, the, the fight for the veterans really has been, been the dominant community issue or had been the, the dominant community issue from the 60s. Well, 60s, it was Marcos, 70s, it was Marcos. But as soon as the Marcos thing fell and there was people power and the new, the new cause celeb in this community was equity for the veterans. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard it presented from the perspective of the women until I heard about your documentary. And I know that your, your documentary is expected to be really more general for all of the veterans because, but here's the thing, at 2009, President Obama was able to get the equity bill passed so that veterans got $15,000 if they were shut out by the Rescission Act from World War II. They got $15,000 a lump sum payment, and those in the Philippines got 9000 And we still have the restriction on the women. So how many of these women are still out there? I guess they would be in their, 
like 90s and hundreds? 90s, hundreds, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, so again, we can't quantify the number because their names were not even added to the roster. Um, and if your name wasn't on the roster, um, the way that the VA policy has shaken out is that if your name is not on the roster, then you're not eligible for the equity benefit. Um, I have heard of numerous stories of um, women who applied and just were turned down and they said, well, I don't know what happened. I don't, they just moved on with their life. Uh, but in the case of uh, Feliciana Reyes, um, she had been a ward attendant um, um, in Dumaguete, um, and she served, uh, we have her records. Um, she worked with the surgeons um, in, the, in the medical unit, in the medical corps. And it's all documented. Uh, she has her affidavit, but she was not listed on the reconstructed guerrilla roster that was done by the US Army. And therefore she was routinely turned down and she fought on her own behalf um, from 2010 until uh, 2015 to, um, to have the ruling overturned, but she didn't know what to do. So finally, um, she ended up with a lawyer um, and she was the first woman to have it argued in a federal appeals court that the US Army policy was unconstitutional based on it uh, because it was based on gender. Um, so, you know, how many other Feliciana Reyes is, are out there? Um, I've talked to several people who said, well, my grandmother fought and she couldn't get the award. Um, you know, she's since passed and the benefit no longer, can't fall through to uh, an, a child. Right. Yes, heirs, yeah. Because of the policy again, because um, even though there's the Equity Act, uh, the Equity Act does not put any of the troops back on active duty, which then made them eligible under the GI Bill, which when they started in 1941 and even in 1944, the GI Bill was in effect, um, which would have provided the same benefits for any other American soldier that had served. Um, so it's just completely unfair. Um, and so tracing through and trying to find people and unfortunately finding out, you know, frequently that when we found somebody that we think, oh, we want to interview this person, unfortunately they had recently passed away or, um, so it's, it's difficult. Yeah, but Feliciana Reyes, I know the Reyes family name is a very common one uh, in, you know, in the Filipino American community, I think, I think I'm related to at least one or two Reyes families. And I, I just know that it, it can't be easy. But are you finding people coming up to you saying, Hey, look, my Nana said this, had this story about, you know, holding a gun and like laying down prone and like shooting it, uh, you know, are you, you, know, are you hearing stories like that? I don't get stories like that very often, because the the standard for people who have served in war is they usually don't talk to their family about it. Um, my father-in-law who passed away recently, he served um, in Vietnam. He flew um, surveillance jets and whatnot. And, and he would not talk to the family about it. His boys talk about it. If they heard anything, it was because they were hiding under the stairs listening when uh, some other military personnel were over and they were swapping stories. Um, the number of us um, who, you know, my father served um, at one point, and um, I had no clue that even his service was relevant to him and his identity until um, right before he passed away. Um, and they came to give him honors and to present him with a flag and a plaque um, that that was two weeks before he passed away. And that was the first time I recognized or realized that um, there were a whole bunch of stories in there that I'd never heard, um, yeah. never thought to ask. And that's how it is. So I don't actually usually get family members that come with details. 
um, what I usually get is somebody's like, oh yeah, I know about that. And then they go back and ask, you know, their mother or grandmother and they're, oh, well, yes, well, we know. Um, so it's tricky getting the stories out. So what, what do you hope to do? I mean, you're near, nearly finished uh, with uh, this, uh, with the documentary. How did Tony Taguba, General Taguba, how did he help? And is there, what was his reaction to your, your putting the women out there as, as uh, examples of the ongoing discrimination still against Filipino veterans? I had the pleasure of meeting General Taguba um, two years ago and um, sitting and interviewing him. And uh, he was so open um, and thank goodness because he is, um, he's really good at kicking me in the butt when I'm down. <laughs> so so what's, he, what's he saying in terms of their, the women are out there, go find them or? Yeah, yeah. so when it comes to the women, um, he's been really, he's been incredibly supportive. Um, in fact, I was kind of biting my nails thinking, uh, I didn't check with anybody before we added the women to the degree that we have. Um, it, and, and it's not a feminist film by any means. It's inclusive though of women. And it's a conversation that hasn't been heard before. And General Taguba, he, he called me up and he says, I like what you've done here. I like that you've included the women. And so far we've gotten a lot of um, great feedback, a lot of support from the people who've seen the rough cut uh, that have enjoyed um, particularly women have enjoyed seeing that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's, it's striking. It's striking. Uh, the, the two things that are striking are, are number is number one, that, that even though the, the lump sum benefits were paid out to, to, uh, veterans in 2009, there's still a lot of people who don't understand that. Okay. Filipino Americans who came to the United States prior to 19, prior to world war two, they came here. They entered the war as members of the Filipino, you know, as a, the regular army. They, they and they went off to fight, you know, where, in World War II. The Filipino, the Filipinos who were really the subject of the Filvets equity battle, are the Filipino Filipinos who remained in the Philippines as members of the Scouts, as members of the USAFFE, who answered the call of. FDR to fight in exchange for all these benefits that never materialized because later on in 1941, I believe, or later on after the war, the rescission act stripped away those benefits. Right. So the, what Obama did in 2009 did not make anyone whole except a handful, except the men and the women who are nurses. And it didn't even in uh, make, people who are whole, those who were not on the registrar. Yeah, I would, I would say not anybody was actually made whole. Um, the, how I personally see the, the equity uh, act there as you know, it, it was a settlement. It was a one-time settlement to those who accepted it. Um, they still weren't called American veterans. Um, and, and we try to unpack why this is a real big deal in the film. This is why we back up to um, the history of the acquisition of the Philippines um, in uh, 1898. And we do talk about Tidings McDuffie and the effect of that, where it effectively stripped um, Filipinos of their, nas their national status. Um, and we repatriated uh, a whole bunch of Filipinos at the time um, so that when the war started, um, the Philippine, Filipinos were not nationals of the United States. However, with the institution of um, the United Armed Forces of the Far East, uh, the USAFE, was um, and, and the creation of the GI Bill in 1940 um, basically said that you join, you become army, now you are a US national and you have rights to certain benefits. Um, 
And then in 1944, um, there was another uh, general order that said, look, if, if you're uh, in the organized uh, guerrilla groups that are organized under MacArthur and under basically his direction and the direction of allied forces, um, you're now Philippine army, which then should have put people right back under those same GI protections. And that didn't happen. Um, and then of course the rescission acts happen and we're saying you're not there, um, you're not a veteran and you now have no benefits. So a lot has been done over the years through the advocacy. And, and I think um, though, even as Marie uh, Blanco says in the film, she's like, we wish we could have done it more than incrementally, but that's what we had to work with. Um, I feel like the Equity Act it was incremental towards getting us there. There, I feel like the uh, Congressional Gold Medal was also another increment. But the final hurdle here is to effectively repeal the Rescission Acts, which could happen through um, the Filipino Veterans Fairness Act, which has been going through for 20 years into committee, dies in committee. But it kind of treats the rescission acts as a typo and it removes the word not on active duty and restores everybody to active duty, restores them to their rights for benefits. Um, so that's really what we're driving at over the course of, you know, our 90 minute film. Right. So it's not just the women. It's if you repeal the rescission act, if that's really the main goal, because the rescission act, even though the equity act, gave a settlement. If you repeal the rescission act, which, you know, created this whole thing in the first place, we can make them whole. They can get, every, they can get the respect and maybe not, maybe it's too late for the monetary, um, you know, thing, but they would get the respect and the honor they deserve. And yeah. it, would, it, would, it would cover all, all people, not just the men, but also the women. Sure, absolutely. And um, there's just, there's so few people left at this point. I, I understand the manipulation. Um, I, the basis of pretty much all um, um, discrimination, um, gender, racial discrimination um, is economic. Uh, and I, I understand that the U.S. government was overwhelmed when um, there were over 1.2 million affidavits uh, offered up by guerrillas who served. Um, and yes, there is some argument as to, well, you know, some of those were fraudulent. I'm, perhaps so. Um, I highly doubt that 80% of them were fraudulent. Um, certainly Feliciana Reyes is, was not fraudulent, yet she was denied uh, and denied and denied. People who have other affidavits, they have records that proving that they served are, are still being turned down to the tune of 56% of the people who applied for the equity compensation were denied. That's an extraordinary number. Um, and that is another you know reason that it gave us pause to say what's really happening here. Um, well, yeah. we we want to see we want to see the film. I I because I I know a lot of people are they're a little surprised to hear us talk about the vets now because a lot of people think oh we won that fight we won that fight eleven years ago right and really no we we didn't quite I win that fight. So. I think it was um again, it was an incremental move forward, but it's not truly, it did not truly equalize Filipino veterans. Again, they're not, uh, the, the Equity Act did not allow Filipino veterans to be considered truly American veterans, and they are, in my opinion. Um, I think it's really, really important that we clear up this final distinction because it is mired in racism and sexism. And I feel like this is, it's kind of ancestral work uh, that the United States really, really needs to be focusing on right now is how to heal what we've, what we've done and how we've come to be. Um, you know, our identity is shifting over the years and 
Um, I feel like we're at this tipping point of who do we really, really want to be as Americans? And I feel like most of us are ready to heal the past. We're ready to say, gosh, we did some really crappy things. Um, starting hundreds of years ago, moving forward. Um, but we can't do that if people don't know. And frankly, the Philippines is part of America. Um, the history of uh, Filipino activity in World War II is not appropriately addressed in the overall narrative of the United States in World War II. Um, you know, one of the people we interviewed, uh, Dr. Colleen Woods, she said, you know, we have um, this history that the United States won the war um, against fascism, that the United States did this, but we did not do this without the Philippines, um, where our troops were outnumbered easily 10 to 1. Um, well, so... Yeah, this is something it's like, uh, like the 1619 project, you know, there's still you people think, oh, slavery, we've done, I mean, how many times have people said, uh, beginning with once again, Obama, uh, or during the Obama years, when Obama was president, that people say, well, we're now in post racial times. No, we're not. Or they'll say, oh, well, and I've heard conservatives say this. Well, now that we have a, a, a first black president, we can you know the the civil war it's been we we've we've we we've made up for that you know and just there were always have been called for reparations and whatnot we start hearing that come up again although it's sort of I haven't heard much about that in the news but we have heard a lot about the 1619 project which is really all about getting to know our american history and for filipinos I think this documentary that you that you and and Amanda are doing are are really really at that, that same kind of level, getting to know American history. In this in this case, as it involves Filipino American or Filipino vets who should have been American, or some some of whom are American, and some of whom became American after they fought in the Philippines and then were allowed into America post 1965. Oh, there's that 65 immigration law again, because when they were allowed to come back here, many of the vets who were fighting for, for equity had had moved and immigrated and had other lives and careers here in the United States. So they were Filipino American. So it's, it's, if we understand some of the facts, uh, we can get beyond to understanding the stories and maybe we can rectify the law. So, so when is the film going to be completed and when will people be able to see the film or what can they do to see trailers or whatnot? So um, we are currently back uh, in fundraising as we are working on post-production aspects. Um, COVID knocked us for a massive loop. Um, we had uh, people lined up with uh, donations for the film that unfortunately they were affected so by COVID that they weren't able to keep those commitments. So we've um, kind of had to go back into how we're finishing the, the funding for the film. But um, while we're doing that, um, we do have, uh, key post-production personnel who are working on deferred pay. My, uh, my goal, and if we, if we were to be funded within the next couple of weeks is to have the um, film finished by the end of the year and ready for release um, at the first of the year. Um, you know, we have talked to one broadcaster in particular who was very interested in the project for um, a, a release in May for AAPI month. Um, prior to COVID, our goal was to have it out so we could be hitting the ground running this October, um, but that did not work. So um, we will have more fundraising coming up. You can visit um, our webpage um, at lffilm.com. Um, you can also, we'll put in a link uh, here on Facebook and you can sure. follow Facebook and on Twitter as well. And sure. that'll get you to trailers. Yeah, it looks like, um, well, I, 
I, I want people to know about this because if they are, uh, if they know of family members who were like those women who, and, and I'll, I'll share, I mean, it's really such a striking image, but it's the image that we, uh, that we, we had uh, up on, uh, up on the uh, invite. I mean, there are women out there and they didn't all just stay in the Philippines and die in the Philippines. Some of them immigrated here subsequently. Yeah. They came to America and they have lived their lives without the recognition and without the pay and without the honor they deserve for being women gorillas. Because as you can see from the from the guidelines, they were from the beginning excluded from recognition. And that is, um, that's an injustice that to this day has not been solved. Right. So uh, Tammy Botkin, the director of the Legacy of the Fighting Filipinos, thank you very much for sharing your story today. Um, and we'll, we'll keep following each other. And, you know, when there's something, when there's an update, we'll, we'll share with our with our museum crowd uh, to those of you who are here on the pop-up and are just hearing about the women uh, for the first time. Well, uh, it's because history has been omitted uh, in general from, from the schools, from the curricula, from, you know, the books. And as we begin to sort of like get our foot in the door and kind of like open it up so that more information, so more stories can get through, that's how we we broaden the knowledge and maybe we get to to the point where we can have people take a, take action like um, I'm sure if people more people knew about this maybe there would be a better result when um, attempts to reject or attempts to uh, uh, to turn turn back or uh, 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 you know to, to, to change the rescission act you know that do you really think that can happen, Tammy? It can happen if we get enough people on board to tip the scales. Um, you know, 330 million Americans about. Um, and when we make enough noise, uh, when we all unite and come together on the issues, um, we can tip those scales. Um, but we all have to know what's going on. We all need to understand uh, the history um and and what we can do now to move it forward if we're going to make that change but i'm hopeful yeah it, it seems like the rescission act would be something easy to do i mean it's it really is the lowest of the low-hanging fruit it's just you know people would rather not uh, i mean they could do that if, i mean if they're not going to pass a stimulus package the house could comes up come up with something like here's a rescission act for the filipinos that that would be a kind of a a nice afterthought or a nice uh, diversion from all the things they could be doing, but this is a thing they should be doing. This is a thing, a, a part of American history. So that said, uh, Tammy, thank thank you again. We will we will follow you and uh, follow your uh, you know your efforts, and hopefully the the film will be done. Thank so, you so much. So thank thank you, Tammy, and uh, thank you all wherever you are. If you are watching us, remember again. This is um, uh, our virtual museum pop-ups that we do here at the Fonz Museum Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we usually come on at uh, 11.45 with our pre-show. We do a This Week in Filipino American History, and then we have a guest. We'll probably do a truncated version of our program tomorrow, but uh, do tune in to our Sunday brunch. In the meantime, uh, enjoy the weekend. Go to the Fonz Facebook page or the Fonz Museum page, and you can see the photos that I showed you or that I shared with you, the, the photo of my, my mom and dad and their birthday cake. Um, we're always uh, looking for ways to raise funds ourselves, so check out the Fonz Museum page. And uh, that's it. So we have more to do. This is Filipino American History Month. Uh, we share it with the Hispanics for the first part of October. And then on the 15th, they kind of, because they go from September 15th to October 15th, but October 1st, to October 30th, by the 15th, it's all our own. And uh, on the 15th, this coming week, there's a lot of things. The, 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 the reason, the ultimate reason we, sh we celebrate Filipino American History Month 
the reason was given on October 15th. And if you are here next week, I'll tell you that story. There are some people who are detractors, but it still mean it still remains the fundamental reason why October is Filipino American history. Month. It's not because my birthday is this. No, no, not because Larry at Leong's birthday. No. There was a, a seminal event that occurred and those in the central coast of California know that seminal event. I'll talk about it next week on this week in Filipino American history. In the meantime, like I said, enjoy your weekend, enjoy October, enjoy. People are recognizing this is Filipino American History Month. I was in a museum uh, director's meeting for the California Association of Museums and a woman who I, I met at one of the conferences, she, we were on a Zoom chat, she chatted, happy Filipino American History Month, right? I mean, there should be Hallmark cards on that. Come on. I mean, I, I, that's the hope. At, I, this is for gaining traction. This idea of uh, Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy, the founders of Fonz, is happening. It's happening. October is Filipino American History Month. Have yourselves a great week. We'll see you again tomorrow on the pop-up. Uh, join us every weekend. I'm Emil Guillermo. Thank you.